What? Not again. Oh, man. Can a guy take a vacation? Okay, well, I guess I've been teleported back to Spokane for another Page Turning Tuesday with Tom. We're on the ranch. My mom and Big Ray have just sort of been Googling at each other. We'll pick it up there. Um, one day I get home to find a skinned deer bleeding out, hanging from a tree in our yard. Big Ray tells me his big hunting story as if I'll be impressed. What's so hard about hunting an unarmed animal? Instead, I'm grossed out and disgusted. How can my nature-loving mother tolerate a guy who shoots and hangs the gory, blood-dripping carcass in view of our kitchen window? Parents assume their kids are too naive to know what's going on, but I'm not stupid. I walk up to the house quietly one day after school and see them kissing and hugging in the kitchen. Seeing them hurts my brain and my body. I know that if John finds out, someone is going to die. Ray has both his hands on my mother's butt. Mine curl into fists. This is wrong. I can't let them get away with it. I march through the door and find them intertwined. My mother is sitting on the counter with her legs wrapped around Big Ray. She still doesn't notice I'm here. What do I have to do to get her attention? Hose them down with cold water like dogs when they get stuck together while doing it? When she does finally see sees me, there's a split second of shock and shame. Then she's pissed at me and frowns, which lasts much longer. Ray's face, on the other hand, being lopsided, is unexpressive. No matter what life throws at him, he's always smirking and looking stupid. I despise his ridiculous accent. It's not just the way his jaw slides to the left or, on, or how impossibly slow he talks. It's his twangy voice that gets stuck in my head and can't find a way out. How was school today? He has the annoying habit of turning one syllable words into two. Fahan, I say, my eyes locked and loaded right on his. I heard that, he says, pulling his hand through his greasy hair. I hope so. I was standing right here when I said it. I say this as mean and as menacing as an eight-year-old kid can possibly do. It suddenly occurs to me that I have something I can blackmail my mother with, and I intend to use it for something big. That night, when she tucks me into bed, I say, I know all about you and Big Ray. Buy me a telescope, and I won't tell John. She slaps my face. There's nothing to tell John. This was a first. I cry, not from the pain, but from the shock of being struck in the voice of her tone. Mind your own business, she says, exiting the room. I wasn't slapped hard, but it hurt more on the inside than it did on the outside, and it affected the way I felt about her. That night, as I tried to sleep, the image of Big Ray and my mother on the kitchen counter eclipsed all other thoughts, and I began to t test my mother almost as I did Big Ray and John. The most intense emotions are raging inside of me. I consider my options in order to teach her a lesson. I could kill myself or run away, although not necessarily in that order. As a minor, I bet I could eliminate Big Ray and be out of jail in no time. Or I could tell John what's going on, who will probably kill one or both of them. I'm disgusted with my mother for cheating on John and for having such low standards. I hate John for the way he treats mom and the rest of us, not to mention kittens and the rest of the animal kingdom. I loathe Big Ray merely for existing and speaking with such a fucked up accent. It's too much to keep inside. It feels like my head is going to explode, so I tell my sisters what I saw and what I know, but they don't even believe me. Chris thinks I just saw them hugging. Shelly thinks I need to have my eyes examined, and Molly thinks I made the whole thing up for attention. I feel utterly alone, abandoned, and lost in the middle of a shark-infested ocean with a slow bleeding wound. Something bad is going to happen. I can feel it. It's just a matter of time. Fortunately, my agonizing angst is deflected when Peggy and her family come to visit. Claire envies the way Chris wears her socks, pulled up high and folded down an inch at the top. My sister grabs a pair and gives them to her, gives them to her god sister. They wear their matching socks the exact same way for the entire visit. We spend almost an entire morning sitting on the fence making up new lyrics to the Winston cigarette song. This is back when there were cigarette commercials on television. Winston had a jingle that starts with, Winston tastes good and ends with, like a cigarette should. We added some lines to the middle so it went like this. 
Winston tastes good like a ooh, ah. Want a piece of pie? Pie too sweet? Want a piece of meat? Meat too tough? Want to ride a bus? Bus too full? Want to ride a bull? Bull too black? Want your money back? Cigarette should. Okay, that was a dorky little poem song that we came up with. We'll cut it off there for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next Tuesday on another edition of Page Turning Tuesdays with Tom. Bye for now. Thank you.